do. There you go. See, I'm from Jersey, so when I talk, it's always like I have a microphone on. I was, I was wondering why you came in here. I was like, uh-oh, something's wrong. Um, so anyway, if, if, if you don't have a schema, it is sometimes faster to, uh, for development time because then you don't have to worry about creating the SQL scripts to add a table or a column. And in some cases, you might need a DBA to verify that the table and column scripts are actually working as they should. Um, it's less verbose than XML, which is... It's saying something, because, you know, we all know XML is like this nice terse language or markup language. Pretty much every programming language can read JSON. And I say pretty much because I haven't used all the programming languages, but every programming language I've used has been able to read it. And I want to make sure I'm covered so somebody can't go, no, well, this language doesn't. And then probably the most important is the fact that some data is unstructured which is hard for me to wrap my brain around because I come from a world where data needs to be structured and everything needs to be in a column and there needs to be relations and you need to have data types and, and you know, if it's not that way, it's just, ugh, drives me crazy. But there are some cases where you don't, unstructured data exists. You can have configuration data. The example we're gonna show, it's configuration data for a golf, uh, an application I wrote for a golf league where yes, the data technically is structured, but I don't need to have it in columns because I'm never going to query, you know, give me all the golf leagues where the golfers had to pay $10 to join the league. That's never gonna happen, so I don't really need to have that in a nice uh, relational table. When I was giving this talk in uh, Montreal last year, somebody said they store exceptions as JSON in the database, and then that allows them to go back and use the JSON functionality to query the exceptions better than they could by looking through the logs. And probably the most important is if your application or what you're doing ingests data from a third party source, a third party API, you have no control over the schema that comes back. And if the schema changes, it's gonna be a pain in the butt for you to take those changes and throw them into any type of relational structure that you may have set up. So in those cases, it makes, I think it makes really good sense to use, J to store stuff as JSON. So the way it's done, the way it used to be done years and years and years ago is developers would store JSON in either a text uh, char or varchar data type. It worked, it wasn't great, but it worked. When you search the values, you actually had to use um, a like search or you had to use regular expressions to search. And the problem with that is you could get inconsistent results because if you have nested objects and the parent object and the child object share a key, meaning the key is the same name, doing a like search it could possibly get results that are different than what you're actually looking for and the same thing with regex. And then the other problem is if you updated any value in your JSON document, it updated the entire column. So it was just like doing a regular update. So if you were just throwing text in there, it was the same uh, promise or the same um, premise. So in 5.7 of MySQL, the JSON data type was introduced. It's designed to hold valid JSON documents. That's important because if you try to store something that isn't valid, you'll actually get an error. The data itself is stored in a binary format that has been optimized for replication and quick searches. And also, you can have a defined schema. Now, some people are like, well, if we're using JSON because we don't want a schema, why would we want to make sure that we have a schema? Well, there could be a time where you're logging information from uh, your, like the person suggested, you're logging exception information, and you want to make sure that every JSON object you store in this database has a particular key. We can actually set that up when you create the table. You can add a constraint. Um, another thing is you might want to be, if, if a particular key exists, I want to make sure it's a number, or that if it's a date, it, it's before or after a certain date, or if it's a number, it's greater than zero. 
All right, we're going to play a game. And the game we're going to play is called Valid or Not. Here's the rules of the game. I'm going to show you an example of some text. I'm going to point to somebody. That person is going to say valid or not. If you say anything besides those two things, you're wrong. And I'm going to call on somebody else. So it's either valid or not. And if you get it right, you get a lollipop. So you got one already in the back. Valid. You're going to test me here. Almost. So that is valid, and that is actually just an empty object. So yay, you got it right. Good job. Next one. You got a lollipop already. Valid. What is that? It's an empty array. Awesome. Heads up. I really got to work on that. You know what it is? You guys are further away than I think. So we got that right. That is valid. What about this? Wrong. It is valid. That is actually valid JSON. Don't ask me why. It just is. <laughs> what about this? Well, what are you going to say? Not. You're wrong. It's valid. Null is a valid, null, null is valid JSON. Okay? Well, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of lollipops when I'm done. Awesome. What about this? Wrong. Now, what? What'd you say? Single quotes. Texts, dates, or, uh, and keys need to be in double quotes. So that's why this is <clears throat> invalid. Well, that was fun. I only gave away a couple lollipops. So for the examples we're talking about, so years ago I took over managing a golf league and I wrote a web application to help me manage the golf league. And one of the concepts in that, in that league is the fact that we have seasons. And each season has a unique set of configuration options. And those configuration options have grown over the years. As I've added more functionality and as we've changed rules in the, um, in the league, I've had to create new columns in the season table to accommodate them, which became kind of a pain in the ass. Because then I had to, I had to update the database, I had to update the getters and setters, and I had to do a whole bunch of stuff just to add one property. And then I realized, you know what, I don't need to do that. I can actually take all the properties that are going to be unique to a particular, or that could be unique to a particular season, create them as a JSON object, store that in a database. Then all I got to do is update the getters and setters of what I already have. And if I need to add a new property, I just add getters and setters and be done with it. So this is the scheme I have. You'll see that the uh, one object is a, it has a course property, which is an object that has the information about the golf course. Then there is uh, a scoring property that has information about the type of scoring that we use. And we have a, the subpool property, which is an array of different types of user roles that can actually have, um, that can play as a substitute in the league. And then we also have uh, use subs, which means whether or not you can use a sub, the league fee, the greens fee, whether or not we use contests, points per hole, golfers per team. There's a lot more. This is just all that could fit on this slide. And I'm not going to go over each one of them. Don't worry about it. So. Creating a table with a JSON data type is very easy. In your, in your column definitions, you actually specify the data type of JSON. Right there. So we have a, we have a column here called season settings, and it's a JSON uh, data type. But what we want to do here is we want to make sure that the league fees property is no greater, I'm sorry, no less than zero. So what we do is we add a check constraint, and in the check constraint we call the JSON underscore schema underscore valid function, and we pass it this configuration where basically we say the main object has to, the main property or the, the main part of the, the root of the JSON needs to be an object, and that it has to have a property named leagues fees, league fees that is a number and the lowest value it can be is zero. 
So if we tried to save a JSON blob where the league fees property was set to negative one, it would throw an error. And you see here it says season, the season settings here is that's where in the, in the JSON schema valid method, the uh, last argument is what column that we're actually going to be using. So inserting JSON, you might think, wow, that's a lot, you know, how do we handle that? Remember, what, what is JSON? What is, what, at its basis, it's a what? String, who said that? See, you get one now. Yes, we make a good team. It's a string, so that means we can just insert it as if it's a string, just like we would any other string. So whether you're using a JSON object or a JSON string or somebody's first name, we can just do insert surrounded by single text. And you'll see here the result of this, if we do select star from season, order by ID uh, descending limit one, we'll get the latest item that came in and you'll see on the end here, it's an empty object like we passed in in that, in that uh, insert statement. So before I go any further, I wanna talk about some helper functions that we have available to us. These are native MySQL functions. The first one is JSON keys. This function is awesome if you're not familiar with the schema. So you can actually call JSON keys and pass it in um, the column name that you're looking for and it will return you an array of all the keys that exist. Now you'll see up here, by default, you don't have to have a second argument in JSON keys. If you don't pass in an argument, the second argument for JSON keys, it gives you all the keys that are at the root of that JSON object. But in this particular case, we want the JSON keys for the scoring object. So we do dollar sign dot property name to get the, the list of keys off of the scoring property which is off the root of the JSON object. Whenever you're dealing with JSON in MySQL and you see a dollar sign, that means you're dealing with the root of the JSON object. There's one exception to that and we're gonna be getting to that shortly. But always remember, dollar sign is the root. So again here, we're, do, we're looking for the scoring property off the root. And it's just got the three keys, title, description, and handicap type. Now this is a function that you should only ever use in, or when you're debugging or you're in development. Don't ever use JSON pretty in production because it could really screw up your results. And the reason why is it, put li it puts line breaks in the, in the return so that instead of getting one long array, we get them broken down like this so it's a little bit easier to read in the console. So another thing we use, or I use a lot, are path operators. And you'll see why I prefer path operators in a little bit, because I think they're a little bit easier to read and they're a little bit easier to, to use. And we have two path operators, and I honestly don't think they actually have names. So the first one is hyphen greater than. Now the hyphen greater than is actually a shortcut for calling uh, JSON extract. So if you call JSON extract on a JSON property as, the, as, the, as we do here, you'd get the same result. And you'll see here again, we do um, the column name hyphen greater than dollar sign course.name. This is actually saying we're going to get the name property off of the course property off the root of the JSON object. But the difference between the hyphen greater than and the hyphen greater than greater than is this one will actually return any quotes that may be around the string or around the property value. So if it's a number, it won't have quotes. If it's a string, it will. If we do the hyphen greater than greater than, that's the same thing as calling JSON extract inside of a JSON unquote method or function. And what that'll do is that will actually return whatever's inside the quotes. And I'll show you what that looks like right here. So you'll see here under course name, because we use the hyphen greater than, it returns the quotes as part of the result. Why they did that, I don't know, because I can't imagine anybody would want to use the information in that way, which is why I always use hyphen greater than greater than, which gives me just the text with no quotes. Okay? So, 
Now we're gonna start talking about querying, querying data based on JSON values. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be returning data from the database based off of the values of certain properties in the JSON object. One method we can use is JSON, is JSON contains, and you'll see the syntax, whoops, sorry, go back. The syntax is here. JSON contains takes three arguments. The first argument is the column that we're talking about. The second argument is the value that we're looking for. And the third argument is the path to that property. So what we're saying here is we want to get the ID, the name, and the league fee, the value of the uh, league fee off the root from season where the season settings column has a property named league fee that equals 70, okay? And as you already saw, this is gonna be the result. Everything comes back where the, league, where the number is 70. That actually works pretty good, except it works great with numbers and it works great with Booleans. It doesn't work great with strings. And the reason why is because in JSON contains, if we want a string, we have to wrap it in quotes. So here, because we're looking for where the core state is equal to WV, we have to say single tick, double tick, WV, double tick, single tick for JSON contains when dealing with strings. Yes, I had that same look on my face that you have right now. It, it is, it's weird, which is exactly why, well, let's show you, this is what the results are. So you see the results are what we would expect. And that's why I prefer to use the path operators to JSON contains or anything like that. And you see here is the same exact query I just showed you using the path operators rather than using JSON contains in the weird double quoting of stuff. And let me, you know what, let me back up real quick and show you something else here. Um, JSON value is a way that you can actually get the value from a particular property and you can actually use the returning uh, keyword to say what type of data you want it to return us. So by, by doing this inside of JSON value, you're basically casting that as a particular value, which I would rather use um, cast because that's what we're doing and it's less confusing. So you see here, we're casting the value of greens fees as a decimal with four spaces and two after the decimal. And then we have where the core state property of season settings equals WV. To me, that's a lot easier to read and a lot easier to parse quickly than what we saw with JSON contains in the double quotes. Because I don't know about you, but when I see double quotes like that, I start to go, whoa, something's wrong. And that's exactly when I, first, the first example I saw JSON contains, I'm like, this has got to be a typo, but it's not. So my suggestion is going to be, if you ever want to get to a particular a value of a particular property in your JSON object, use the path operators. And use hyphen greater than greater than. Don't use the other one, because the other one leaves stupid stuff in there when you have strings. And then here's what the values look like. You can see that it's actually cast as two decimal spaces. So, as I said before, when you have a JSON object, one of the properties or the actual JSON object itself could be an array. And there is a function we have available to us that will allow us to query that array as if it is a table. And that is called JSON table. So what we're doing here, and this, is, this gets a little complex, so you see at the top, we're doing select ID and name from season, but we're also calling group concat on a property called sp.roles. You'll see sp doesn't exist in the from statement initially. But then we go down here to JSON table. So as I said, what JSON table does is it will actually allow us to create a join between our table that we're dealing with and the values of an array inside of each JSON object in every row in the database. And this takes a couple of um, arguments. The first one, excuse me, is the column that we're, that we're using. So here you'll see we're doing s.season settings because I alias that with s because it was a lot of typing and stuff went off the side. Um, the second argument is the path to the array that we want to use. 
And in this particular case, we want to use every element, that's what the star inside the brackets is, for the property named subpool that is off the root of the object. And then the second part of this, or the last part of this, is we have a columns definition. So we use the keyword columns, and then we pass in the, the name that we want to use. So the first part is the name. The second part is what data type we're going to use. And then the path. And you'll see here, the path is dollar sign dot type. Remember I talked about earlier that dollar, dollar sign always represents the root of a document except for one case? This is that case. When you're using JSON table and you're specifying your columns, the dollar sign is the root of the particular item you're looking at in the array, not the JSON document itself. So we have a property called type that is inside of every object in our subpool array, and that's what this means. And then we have role, again we set it as varchar20, we set the path to dot name. And then here, we have to alias it. Whenever you use JSON table, you have to use an alias. If you don't, it'll throw an error, okay? So that's where the SP comes from. That's where this group, S, or group concat sp.role uh, comes from. And then we go, in the where clause, we say where the subtype, so this column, equals role, and then the core city, which is part of the season settings, is equal to Charlestown. And then we group all those together so that we get uh, the, the, the grouping cat will work. So we say we want to group it by the ID of the course. And then when we run this, you'll see that for the first group, there's just one role. But for these last two, there's multiple roles. And each one of those came from a particular element inside of the array of the property named subpool. JSON table is very, very, very helpful if you need to search through data that's in a JSON array because you can do like what I just did and say where, where a value in the array equals this. So updating JSON values. There's three ways that we can update the values of JSON properties in a JSON document. The first is JSON insert. JSON insert will insert a new key into a JSON document. It will not update the value if the key already exists. And you can actually add multiple keys in a single method call, so if you have, or a single statement, so if you have a bunch of different values that you need to update, you can just call JSON insert once and it'll handle multiple instances of that. So then we have JSON replace. JSON replace will update a value of existing keys in a JSON document, but it will not add them. So if you call JSON replace and you, you specify a, a property that doesn't exist in a particular JSON document, it won't add it. And again, you can add multiple keys in a single statement. And then lastly, and this is the one I tend to use most, um, JSON set, it inserts and updates. So if, if the key already exists, it adds the new value you pass in. If it doesn't exist, it creates it and sets the value. And it's not on here, but you can probably imagine, yes, you could do multiple at one time in one call. So let's show some examples. So here's JSON insert. And you'll see what we do here is we do update season, set season settings equals JSON insert, season set JSON insert. The first argument is the, the column we're using, so we do season settings. And then we're going to insert the, whoops, I did it again. We're going to insert a league fee property, and we're going to set it to $25.5. $25 so in this middle example, this is the, um, the season that we just created in the beginning where we, we, empty, we put in an empty uh, JSON object. So now we have a league fee of 25.5, but you'll see over here in an existing one, the league fee stayed the same. It didn't get updated. JSON replace. JSON replace pretty much takes the same arguments where the first argument is the column we're going to use, the second argument is the property that we want, to, uh, we want to replace, and then the last argument is the value. Again, in our new property you'll see, or our new league season rather, you'll see that the golfers per team value doesn't exist, but the golfers per team value over here was set to four. And then on JSON set, again, we pass in the column name, 
the property we want, which again, we're gonna do golfers per team and we're gonna set it to two. And you'll see here in the new one that we created, the golfers per team now exists. And over here, it's actually, it set it back to two. JSON set to me is a little, it's, it's, it's a little bit better because you don't have to worry about, you know, does it exist, does it not exist? You can just set it and take care of it. And then we can remove properties from a JSON object using JSON remove, where the first argument is the column name, and then the second argument would be uh, the property or the path to the property we want to remove. You'll see here now that the golfers per team is removed from there and it's removed from there as well. When you actually do update statements like this, you don't have to do global stuff like I did here. You can actually add a where clause. Um, I just didn't for the sake of this demonstration or these demonstrations. So this I think is actually really cool in the fact that if you have relational data inside of a table that also has uh, JSON data, you can return all of the stuff as JSON. And the first way we can do that is with a method called JSON object. JSON object takes pairs of arguments. So if you're using JSON object, you have to have a number of arguments that is evenly divisible by two. If you don't, you'll get an error. In each pair, the first argument is the name of the key you want returned. The second argument is the value. So if you see here, we call JSON object, we're gonna have a, a, a parameter called ID that is equal to the value of the ID column, a parameter called name, or a key called name, which is the, the name column, then we have the start date, start date, and then here we have a, a property called settings, but we're returning the season settings, which if you remember, is a JSON object to begin with. And this is what that would look like for the league that we just created, where we only have that one setting in there. So it's smart enough to realize that when we're returning JSON, to return it as JSON when you're using JSON object. JSON array ag, um, I tried coming up with good examples for JSON array and I really couldn't because everything I wanted to do was usually re the result of trying to aggregate values from other stuff. So what JSON array ag does is it will actually create an array of values uh, based off of the, uh, based off of results and it groups them. And you don't actually have to use a group by for, for this, in this case. So here we say JSON array, array ag, and then inside that we have a JSON object. So this tells me right away that we're gonna be returning an array of JSON objects, okay? And inside that object we have the ID, the name, and the start date. And then we have from season where ID is greater than 22 and we order it by the start date, descending. And this is what our result will be. It's actually just an array, we can see from the top and bottom, of the objects that we specified. Array ag also comes in handy if you have um, a table that you have a, a parent-child relationship with and you, wanted to re you want to return uh, multiple child data inside of one row or one inside of one JSON object from the parent. So you can actually use array ag on the, child, on the child data inside of a join or as, with a join, I should say. So this is all good. Being able to search properties on JSON like this, I think is awesome, but it's expensive. Even though it's been optimized for searching, it's expensive to go through each of the objects in a row, especially when you consider the fact that each document can be up to a gigabyte in size. So each JSON object column that you have can support each row can support up to a gigabyte of data. Now think about how big or how much data a gigabyte of JSON data is. That's pretty insane. Now imagine you have a system that has even half that size, but there's tens of thousands of rows and you need to search by a particular property. There's gonna be a performance hit there. Fortunately, we can index JSON data. So we can actually create an index on a JSON column that is for a particular property. Now, has anybody here played with uh, MySQL Document Store? Whoo, awesome. So inside of the Document Store API, there's actually a way, that there's a method called create, collect, or, um, create index. 
That actually follows a different path that I'm showing you here because it has to be backwards compatible with um, earlier versions. This example that I'm going to show you uses a functional index, which if I remember correctly was first introduced in I want to say 8.0.13. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run a very simple, we're going to run an explain plan on a very simple query. We're going to select everything from season where the course or the city name of the course in the season settings property is equal to Charlestown. And this is what we get. And the important thing we want to look for here is the possible keys and the key values. If we had proper indexes on this particular table, then those would actually be populated with the indexes that it would use. So the way we create an index, and this is when we're using, when we're doing a functional index. If you do create index using the, uh, the API for MySQL document store, it actually creates a generated column and then creates an index off of that. This, we're doing it differently, we're actually creating a functional index uh, of the data. So the first thing we need to do is we need to call cast. And the reason why is, remember I told you the path operator is just a shortcut? for uh, JSON extract inside of JSON unquote. JSON extract returns a data type of text. What can't you do with data type of text? You can't index it. So our functional index, we actually have to cast whatever is returned from the, the, um, the core settings where we're getting the core of that city as char. In this particular case, I picked char 100. Was it overkill? Yeah, probably. I, can't, I don't know too many city names outside of any place in Wales that would have 100 characters, but that's the way I did it. And then you see the last thing we need to do here is we need to set the collation to UTF-8 MB4 underscore bin. And the reason why that is is because the values returned from JSON unquote are collated as UTF-8 MB4 underscore bin. If you don't do this, the index will be created. It just won't be used because the collations don't match. So after we create the index, we do show indexes from season. And you'll see now we have the second, it's the second row because the first one is the ID. I didn't want to put that up there. Um, and you'll see down here, you can actually see what the expression is, and you can see here where it actually changed that path operator to JSON unquote JSON extract. And then if we go back and we recheck the explain plan, you'll see now it's actually showing it's using the index that we created. That's actually pretty cool. I, I actually like that a lot. And could I have created that index using the way it does in, in the document store API by first creating a generated column and then creating the index? Yeah, but I couldn't do it in one, set, in one statement. I wanted to, do, wanted to show you how you could do it in one statement. So for anybody who's interested, this, this URL here um, will take you to the documentation for the, um, I'm sorry, the, it'll take you to the JSON function reference for MySQL. Everybody good there? I still see a couple phones up. You want me to keep them out? There's another one coming next. Good? Okay. So one of the things that we as the community team have been able to do is we work with uh, Oracle University. If you've never heard of Oracle University, that's the group that manages our certifi the Oracle certifications as well as any training responsible for those certifications. We actually have an agreement with Oracle University that whenever we speak, we can actually offer free training or free certifications to the people who attend our sessions. This fits right into my giving away free stuff because I don't have to pay anything for it. But if you scan this QR code, you'll, you'll be brought to a page where if you already have an Oracle account, you can use that to sign in. If not, you can create one. And then this is actually a relatively new process. Um, so please bear with the people who, who, who get this information because I don't get it because once, once you take the screenshot and go to the URL, I'm done. I've done my job. Um, and it will actually, I, I forget how much it is. I want to say it's $200. It could be less than that. But basically you have two months to take any type of training that you can that would match that or register for a certification exam. And it's free. It won't cost you anything. Except for the fact that Oracle has your information. 
Sorry, can't help you there. So, wow, I did pretty good considering we stopped pretty late or started pretty late. Does anybody have any questions? That means either I did a really good job or I did a really bad job. I'm gonna go with the former because I have a very fragile ego. So, now it's time to give away the free stuff. And again, I didn't pay for this, so I don't really care. Um, I told you guys you need to pay attention to everything I say, everything you see. How much does my dog weigh? What was that? 106 pounds. You want the hat or you want the dolphin? This is not going to go very far. <laughs> See? Wow, that was like Donovan McNabb. All right, so the next question is, um, how many babies have I delivered? Three. You had your hand up. Three. Three. And that is why I don't play baseball. If nobody has anything else, our time here is done. Thank you for spending the last part of the day with us or with me, I appreciate it. And you guys have a great rest of the conference.